We're going to talk about work aim today, next week, and probably the week after that, because it fits in very nicely with acquired conscience and real conscience and what we've been talking about recently. We're all helped by life when things go well with us. Ospensky said, life is too easy for you all. And he could have said that to you. Ospensky could stand here today, if he were alive, and say to this group, life is too easy for you all. In fact, he could say that almost anyone in America. In fact, almost anyone in the world. There are places on the planet where it's not too easy. But for us, it is too easy. When life is difficult, we feel offended and depressed. When life is difficult, we feel like, well, how dare life be difficult for me? And we're offended. And then we feel like it never happened to anybody else. So we're depressed. It's like, well, life is perfect for everybody else. It's just difficult for me. And so we get depressed about it. Like life singled us out to pick on us. Now, you know, a lot like you feel with me. He's singling me out and picking on me. <laughs> well, and that's actually true. <laughs> I am actually singling you out and picking on you. It's what you pay for. Because in life, you don't get anything unless you pay for it. And if you want something here, you have to pay for it. And if you've paid for it, this is a great place because you'll get what you paid for. When you get what you paid for, you almost always say, that's not what I ordered. <laughs> Take that back. That's not what I ordered. But trust me, Father knows best. <laughs> it is what you ordered. It just doesn't look the way you expected it to look. Later, you will see that it's exactly what you ordered. And that's why you're still here, because later you have seen, well, that's exactly what I ordered. That's really what I wanted. It didn't look like it when I first got it and didn't feel like it, didn't taste like it, didn't smell like it, but that was what I ordered. That's what I wanted because it did the trick. So when life is difficult, we feel offended and depressed, then the help of life is withdrawn from us. In that case, we're machines, functions of external circumstances. That's what a machine is. A machine is something that functions due to external circumstances at the request, at the order, at the initiation of external circumstances. When you are operating at the behest of external circumstances, you can be called a machine. Not a thinking being, not a self-directed, conscious, independent being, but a function of external circumstances, which is not really a nice thing to be called. So when people are offended by being called machines, it's silly to be offended because if you're a machine, well, then you are. There's no sense in being offended about it. There's some sense in trying to understand it so that you can get out of it. But it's, it's silly to be offended by it. But people are offended by it. And with good cause, because if they don't understand that there's a way out, or if they don't believe it, mostly people don't believe it, and that's where they're offended. You're calling me a machine, a cold, unfeeling thing, devoid of any will. Well, yes, that pretty much sums it up. That's what I'm saying. People are. Cold, unfeeling things, pretty much devoid of will. Yes, it's in self-determination. I would say that that explains it pretty nicely. And it's not nicer to say machine than you're a cold, unfeeling thing that is devoid of any self-determination and will. And that doesn't sound nice at all. It's like, we, we really want to fight about that. Then we can really get offended and depressed. See, the great thing about life is that when you're happy, when you're in love, everybody is in love with you. Everybody's happy. You, you, everything goes well with you. When you're a grumpy negative, creepy creep, it doesn't go so well. And that's all that this is saying. It's saying when you're in a good state, life helps you. When you're in a bad state, life does not help you. That's what it's saying. And that's the truth. And it's verifiable. Look at your life and look at how that's worked. You can turn things around almost anywhere you go by smiling and being pleasant. Almost anywhere you go on this planet, you have the power to turn whole groups of people just by smiling and being pleasant. Now, that's power. Why? Because they're machines. But life will start to go well with you when you do that. Turn it the other way and life won't go so well for you. Have you got something in you that can resist the ups and downs of life? Or are you driven by life? Mostly, I think we'll have to admit we're driven by life. But hopefully, at this point, you'll be able to say, yes, I, I think I've got something in me that's beginning to develop that could resist some of the ups and downs in life. Everybody here who has a job, who was trained, who went to school, found something inside of themselves that could resist the ups and downs of life. It's how they accomplished their goal. It's how they made it through school. It's how they made it to the end of something. Because that's not the normal thing for us to do. 
if we can find a way out, we'll take it. But we saw something that we wanted for Tammy. It was being an RN. Tammy saw that and she said, well, this is what I want and I'm willing to work for it. Well, come on, Tammy, let's go to the dance. Let's go to this party. No, I need to study. You don't need to study. You're always studying. No, I really need to study because I want this. But don't you want to go to the party? Yes, but I want this too. And if I go to the party and if I keep going to parties, I won't get what I want. So she resisted the ups and downs of life so that she could get what she wanted. Everybody did that in some way, some in big ways, some in small ways. And so by doing that, we develop something inside of us that can resist the ups and downs of life. That's what I'm talking about. What if when life sucks, you realize that it really blows? It's not much, is it? It's not much of a switch, but when life sucks, if you look at it like, well, you know, it really blows, you can change everything. If life isn't sucking, it's blowing, then get a sailboat because that's what this life is about. This life is about seeing how it is, choosing a perspective, choosing a perception, choosing a ground of being, and then committing yourself to it and following it to its natural end. That's it. That's what this life is about, quite simply. You've got a sailboat when you begin to apply the ideas of this work to yourself. What it does is it gets you out of the sea. It gets you out of the water. Now, I don't know about you, but swimming the English Channel sounds like a great idea. Maybe. One time, maybe. But to spend the rest of my life in the English Channel is not a good idea. Hypothermia, fatigue, uncomfortableness, not having a life, all those things spring to mind. I don't want to do that. Now, it might be something I do for a little while, but it's not something I want to continue to do. Being in life and being tossed and thrown and moved around by the waves, by the tides, by the weather, by the wind, and that's not such a great place to be, being in the sea of life. Being in a boat is a step better, isn't it? If you can get out of the water and into a boat where you can actually get some direction in the sea of life, where when life blows, you can set your sail in a certain way and point your bow in a certain way and get somewhere where you have some direction, where you have the ability to move. Now, I'm not saying you don't have the ability to move in the sea, but what I'm saying is it doesn't do you much good plunk somebody down in the middle of the Atlantic and say, there you go, pal, swim. They're lost. I mean, let's face it, they're lost. You put somebody in a boat with a sail and a rudder in the middle of the Atlantic, and they've got a chance of getting someplace. But you don't have much of a chance of getting any place except in some fish's stomach if you're just out there by yourself swimming for it. It's the difference between tasting and hearing this work. When you begin to apply the ideas to yourself, you're tasting them. You just hear the ideas. They sound good. We are getting a lot of this from the podcast listeners now. This is hard. This is hard. Now, they've listened to, you know, maybe 8 or 10 or 12 podcasts, and now it's hard. It sounded good at first, but now it's hard. Well, right, because now enough time has passed in life for you to have an opportunity to apply some of these ideas. And now it's hard. <laughs> When you're just talking about them, they all sound wonderful. Oh, yes, that's right. This will help me. Oh, that's a good idea. Oh, that sounds so good. But now it comes time to applying them and we find the resistance, the second force to the application of those ideas comes mostly from ourselves. And it comes from life, but it comes mostly from life in us because that's what was built into us as life. What we acquired was life. We acquired this world and the way it does things. And it's contrary to who we are and how things can be done that will lead us to a higher state, to a better place, to a better state of consciousness. When I say better place, I'm not talking about heaven. <laughs> it's not die and go to heaven. You can die and go to heaven right now, but you don't have to leave your chair. It's a state of mind. It's a state of consciousness. You can be in a better state of consciousness. You can be in a worse state of consciousness. You can be in a more expanded state of consciousness. You can be in a more contracted state of consciousness. When you're angry and nasty and mean, are you in a better state of consciousness or a worse state of consciousness? Okay. Is it a more expanded state of consciousness or is it a more contracted state of consciousness? If you can see that, can you make a choice not to be in a contracted state of consciousness? Well, sometimes. <laughs> and that's the problem. Then it becomes hard, you see? Now that you have these standards set up, then it becomes hard. But if you didn't know that, if you hadn't heard this, it's never hard. Life just sucks. But once you hear these things, then life doesn't just suck, it blows. Because now you have the tools to do something about it. It's not going to be easy. 
but you can get from here to there once you get into the boat. And this work is the boat. These ideas are the boat. The real aim of this work is about your relationship to higher centers and real conscience. All aim in the work must be connected with the work. We make this mistake, and people make this mistake, and I've seen this for nearly 40 years. People make the mistake of thinking that they can take esoteric ideas and turn them into money for themselves, merit for themselves, prestige for themselves, fame for themselves. And that's not the way it works. Now, people do that, but the ideas themselves decay. They degenerate when you do that to them. That soils them, that disintegrates them, it dissolves them. Ego is a solvent for these ideas. Either these ideas are applied to your ego and dissolve it, or your ego is applied to these ideas and dissolves the ideas. It happens one way or the other, but it doesn't happen both ways. So when people try to take these ideas and make money from them and make fame and fortune and big things from them, change the world, they dissolve, they disintegrate. They become smaller and smaller and smaller until they can't even be called the same ideas. They change from big eyes to little mechanical eyes. And it's not that the ideas change so much, it's that as you move into smaller and smaller eyes, you can hold less and less and less of the ideas until finally you're holding none of the ideas, you've just got this form of the ideas, this ritual of the ideas, but you don't have the ideas. It takes consciousness and a lot of it to hold these ideas. And that's why we have so much trouble holding these ideas. That's why we can't remember these things. It's like, well, I knew that just a minute ago. I just had it. But now it's gone. Well, because your consciousness changed. Because consciousness is constantly changing. It's constantly flowing. What do you think you should change in yourself? It's not a question I want you to answer out loud right now, but it's a question that you need to ask yourself from time to time. What is it you think you need to change in yourself? Because we have these vague notions. Well, I, I think I should wake up more. Well, I think you should too. Uh -huh. So what is it you think you should change? Well, I should be more awake. He said, but what is it you think you should change? Well, I shouldn't be so asleep. He said, but what is it you think you should change? Do you see how it's a problem? We can't, we don't have anything to really tack it down to. Well, now some of us, some of us who, who are, some of us, no, well, I need to stop lying. <laughs> I need to stop pretending about this. I need to stop. When people say to me, how are you feeling? I need to stop saying, oh, just fine, and mechanically answer and say, well, let me check. I'll see. I haven't thought about it for a minute. I haven't thought about it for a while. I mean, I'm feeling okay. Thanks for asking. Or, well, you know, I'm not feeling so good. I'm not feeling so well. I'm feeling kind of physically a little off. Or I'm feeling mentally a little off. Or I'm feeling emotionally a little off. I'm going to stop lying about that when people ask me that question. And then people will stop asking me that question. <laughs> Acquired conscience will say one thing and the work will say another thing because the work acts in the place of real conscience until real conscience is awakened in us. So when I say, what is it you think you need to change about you? Acquired conscience will say one thing. It'll say something that is more surface, more outer, more what will make life go smoothly for you. But real conscience doesn't care about that. Real conscience really doesn't care about how smoothly life goes for you. Real conscience is more interested in life being more difficult for you, not easier. Real conscience is going to thrive in difficulty. Acquired conscience is going to thrive in ease. Where do you think you're going to get something real, more real, more lasting for you? If you thought it was going to be an acquired conscience, you wouldn't be an RN because you didn't go to the dance all the time. You didn't go out with your friends all the time. You didn't go to the party all the time. You stayed home and studied a lot because you wanted something real and lasting for yourself. But well, we can have fun right now. Yes, but I want something real and lasting for myself. I'll have fun later. You've had your share of fun, haven't you? Yeah, I noticed that. She likes to hide her fun. You know, She doesn't like to say she's had a lot of fun, but she has had a lot of fun. I know, I've seen her have fun. Ordinary ideas won't change our being. The ideas you find in life won't change your being. Ordinary ideas won't change your being. You go to Papa John's Pizza and you talk to the people there. It's not going to change your being. It's not going to change your being. You go over here and talk to your neighbor about the lawns and about how good his garden looks. It's not going to change your being. Those are ordinary ideas. If you want to change your being, you need big ideas that come from somewhere outside of life. That's why I'm so boring. I don't talk about ordinary things. All I want to talk about is this. And after a while, it's like, you know, 
Let's stop inviting him to dinner. He's putting me to sleep. I don't want to talk about this all the time. Doesn't this guy ever talk about anything else? Well, like what else? Ordinary ideas? Yeah, I talk about ordinary ideas. Not that much. Why? They're not really that important. It takes so long because our base of authority must change from us to the work. We've got to get this authority thing straightened down. We've got to realize that we are not the authority, that we need a higher authority, and that work acts as the temporary higher authority until we can awaken the real higher authority inside of us, real conscience. Everyone has access to real conscience. Everyone has real conscience. Real conscience is the same in everyone. It's the same for everybody. Now, the problem is acquired conscience takes its place. What we need to do is shift from acquired conscience to this work. And this work acts as the bridge between acquired conscience and real conscience. Until we can wake up real conscience in us, we obey the work. What does that mean, obey the work? Don't express negative emotions. Try to externally consider people. Don't internally consider. Don't go with little, mechanical, petty, negative eyes. Go with bigger eyes. Go with broader eyes. Go with eyes that hold bigger ideas. That's what this work says. And that's what we need to obey. Now, it's not easy, but we need to obey it. It's not easy to get the RN. It's not easy to get the degree. It's not easy to get the brass ring. You have to make effort. Have you decided that it's worth the effort? Yes, you're here. Then make the effort and stop whining. Or make the effort while you're whining. The problem is that we are full cups. So the authority is not going to change that easily because we're full cups. We're already full. We think we know. We're already full of knowledge. We think we know already. And as long as we think we know, there's no room for us to get anything else. We need to get rid of some of what we've got in our cups before we can get anything else to fit in them. The problem with all of us is that we think we know. So I say something, well, how does he know that? It challenges our authority. How dare he challenge my authority? How dare he challenge my authority? He doesn't know. How does he know? I know. That's really what we're saying. Think about that. It's not going to change your being. Unless you change your ideas, unless you get something out of your cup that's in your cup now and get something new in your cup that's not in your cup now, your being is not going to change. Can you see that? If you want a cup of tea and you have a cup of milk, you're going to have to get rid of the milk before you can get a cup of tea. That's it. You're not going to change what's being in that cup until you get rid of what's in that cup. You're not going to change your being with ordinary ideas, the ideas that you already have. You need something else. You've got to trust something else. And that's the hard part because we are so full of ourselves and our own ideas and our own knowledge that we're not willing to trust the work. But the work takes us slowly. And it says, don't believe, but verify. Because it knows the only lasting change has to come from verification. It cannot come from belief. Remember I talked about the seminars and for 72 hours you're a believer and you know and you're the best salesman for that seminar, whatever that was. But then 72 hours is gone and it all starts to go away. It's because you believed it, but you didn't verify it. Because it sounded good, but you never actually practiced it. We make rules, not aims, because we see objects, not events. Let me give you an example of this. We see objects. It's so difficult for us to see events. We see objects everywhere we look. We see an object sitting in an object. There's Tammy sitting in a chair. We see this object, this lectern. We see this object, this table. But you take that table and you set it for breakfast. And now you can see an event. The table has participated in an event. Now, with us, the wonderful thing about breakfast is that if somebody inadvertently takes and they're eggs for breakfast, but you get a raw egg. Somebody didn't cook your egg, and you go to crack it open. You know, it's a little soft-boiled egg thing, and it's a little egg dish there, and you go to crack it open, but it's raw, and it goes running all over. It's turned into a negative event because it's not the way it was supposed to be. So, you see, we see objects, not events, and we need to shift so that we can see events. But we can't see events right now. We can't see events right now because we can't see three forces. We can only see two forces. We can only see the first force and second force. What's the first force and second force? Active and passive forces. Good. So we can't see the neutralizing force. We can't see the force that makes the active and the passive forces come together. The neutralizing force that makes them come together into a triad that makes something happen. So you have the table, you have the egg, but you don't have breakfast. Well, why not? Well, you need something else. Well, what is it you need? Well, you need to be there. That would that'd help. You could bring the neutralizing force. You could bring the neutralizing force. Your appetite. That could be the neutralizing force. You make the event happen. So then what could happen of the possibility is now something that does happen. We start off 
trying to see events rather than object. An event has happened because a triad swept you up like a tornado and set you down somewhere else. Here you were in a life of objects, just walking around through life, objects. Let's say you're at the grocery store and you're walking around shopping, objects. You're picking up objects and you're putting them into your cart, objects that you need for some event. But you're not looking at it as an event. You're looking at it as an object. And then all of a sudden, you see somebody in the grocery store who you haven't seen in three years. And they come over and they make your day the worst possible day that you've ever had in your life. They tell you that this person died and that person died and this person is in jail and this person has cancer and this person has some flesh-eating disease and it's contagious and everybody in their family has it and it might be in your family tree now and you better check your hands and see if you have any sores, open sores. And you're just all of a sudden in this event. Like a tornado has picked you up and it puts you down someplace else. Here you are in this land of objects, just shopping with the music going in the background. But now this event has swept you up, carried you off and dropped you down somewhere else in some other state of... I think I have a flesh-eating disease, or I may be dying of cancer, and everybody in the world is dead. They're dropping like flies. Somebody told me that the other day. They're dropping like flies. Yes, it's what people do. They die. We're all going to die. So here we are, swept away by this event, because we don't see events, we see objects. But if we could see events, we could avoid some events, couldn't we, if we could see them? If we weren't seeing just objects, if we were seeing events, potential events, we could pick and choose events. We wouldn't have to be swept away by tornadoes and dropped in some other place, possibly maimed in the process of traveling from here to there. We need to understand what the sly man is in this work. You remember the story of the Gospels of the Virgins, the wise virgins and the foolish virgins? I don't know why I always want to say virgins. Well, there were these... <laughs> wise versions and there were these foolish versions. <laughs> I don't have an aversion to virgins or I don't have this clinging to versions. I just have this speech impediment where I find it <laughs> difficult to say virgins when versions is so easy to say. The wise virgins weren't wise. They were clever. Uh, think about it. They really weren't wise. The word that translated wise means clever. It's the same word that we use when we say sly man. Clever. Mentally awake. See, the wise virgins were clever, mentally awake. They weren't particularly wise. They just were awake enough to bring more oil. The foolish virgins didn't. That's all. There's nothing particularly wise about bringing more oil. There's something clever about it, though. It's smart. Learn how to be smart. Learn how to be clever. Learn how to be mentally awake. That's what this work is about, to learn how to be mentally awake, how to be more clever, how to see events instead of objects. See, the clever virgins, they saw an event. There's going to be this wedding. We need enough oil in our lamps. The foolish virgins, they saw objects. We've got oil, we've got lamps. Let's go. That's the difference. Aims turned toward life are no use in the work. Life aims don't work in the work because life aims are made from something on the external part of you, little eyes mechanical eyes, whereas real aim comes from something deeper in you. The little mechanical eyes that didn't go to the party, that studied instead, weren't really little mechanical eyes. They were really deeper eyes. They had more that they wanted. They wanted something over a longer period. They wanted something bigger. There were bigger eyes with a bigger aim. The ones that wanted to go to the party or go to the pizza or go to this or go to that, those little eyes didn't win out. They're wise or clever eyes and foolish eyes. The clever eyes said, well, if I don't do this now, I can have all of this later. Whereas the little foolish eyes said, well, if I, I can do this now, that's all there is. Later we'll do, let tomorrow take care of itself. And tomorrow did take care of itself. They didn't get in to the wedding feast. And so that's how tomorrow took care of them itself. Tomorrow took care of itself and they weren't there. Here's the deal. Don't let the left hand know what the right hand is doing when you make aims. What does this really mean? The left hand represents personality. It's the weaker part of us. In allegory, in esoteric teaching, the left represents the weaker part of us. I know there are people who left-handed, and that's the stronger part of them. We're not talking about that. Try to let the little eyes who want to fight just go over there in the corner. They can wait in the corner. And let the bigger eyes who want to understand this work and who want to understand how to do something in life let those eyes come to the fore and let them talk and discuss and understand. So the left hand represents the personality. It doesn't know what the right hand is doing. The right hand represents the deeper, more real side of you. 
that's the part of you that needs to be doing the doing, the right hand, the deeper part of you, not the left hand, the personality part of you. Real aim is reached by sailing, not swimming in this sea of life. Real aim depends on emotional perception of something you dislike in yourself and wish to change eventually. You know when you start to get a real aim, when you become dissatisfied with some part of yourself in you, something in you, and you wish it to change, and you know that it's not going to change right away. It's going to take a long time. Real aim has begun to be formed. But you can't really put it in a nutshell. It's this kind of ambiguous thing, and that's not bad. The personality can't really understand it. But if the personality could really understand it, it would block it, because it doesn't want you to change. It likes you just the way you are. So you don't let the left hand know what the right hand's doing. You don't let the personality know what your real deeper being is doing. So you can't really talk about it so much. Unless you rely on the work and yourself to keep your aim, it's going to lead to false personality, to a feeling of merit. Real aim nourishes you, the real you, and understanding. False aim does not nourish you, and it certainly does not lead to understanding. False aim is instant gratification. Real aim is going to really nourish you and really give you a deeper, fuller understanding of all of these ideas. You can verify all this yourself. False aim can't develop understanding, and what it makes is Puritans. We talked about your task last week was to consider the difference between acquired conscience and real conscience, one being inflexible and one being relative. And acquired conscience develops Puritans. It makes Puritans out of people. They have a bunch of little rules that they slavishly adhere to no matter what. Burn her! She's a witch! Those are Puritans. Going by little rules that they make everything else adhere to. They try and make everything else adhere to. They try and fit the whole world into their little rule system. That's acquired conscience. That's very inflexible. As you can see, it can be very dangerous. Real conscience isn't like that. But people who keep rigid little internal decisions end up being puritanical. We've all done it. And we've all seen the aftermath of it. Broken relationships, strained relationships, family separated, big problems that are not necessary. You'll see this often with people who get religion. They get religion, next thing you know, nobody's good enough for them. They got a bunch of rules that they're keeping and nobody else in the world is good enough for them. You're a sinner, you're this, you're that. They don't want anything to do with all those people. They alienate all these people. They alienate their own families. Oh, you've got to do this and you've got to believe this or else you're not, you've got to accept my little rigid puritanical beliefs or else you're not good enough for me. That's acquired conscience. That's a problem. With real aim, you see difficulties of keeping it. When you've got real aim, you start to see second force. You start to say, I can't do this. <laughs> that's what you start to see. I mean, that's what I see. When I make a real aim, I look at it and I go, I can't do this. And I know I can't. And I can't every day. And I prove it every day that I can't. But I keep doing it because it's still my aim. And I don't do it every day. But I get closer and I get stronger and I understand more every day. Well, I never get the aim, but I get closer and I understand more and I get stronger. And that can't be a bad thing. Formatory aim is different. You can keep it. People do it all the time. A rigid, puritanical little aim. Oh, I'm not going to have anything to do with those people. And you can do that. That's formatory. Make your aims with the object of seeing that you can't keep them. We then see the second force. There are two kinds of people when you sail. I used to just be a sailor. There are two kinds of people. There are sailors and there are stink potters. Stink potters are people who drive power boats. That's what they called them back then. I don't know what they call them now, but that's what they called them back then in Florida when I was sailing. In a power boat, you just put the gas in it, crank it up, it's loud, it's noisy, it stinks, you know, it smokes, it bubbles the water, and you go. You point the boat and you go. A sailboat, you had to think. You had to think about where the shallow water was, you know, where the thin water was, and where the thick water was. You had to think about staying away from this sandbar. You had to think about tacking because you wanted to get here. We're going to get there, but the wind was against you. The wind wasn't going the way you wanted to go, so you had to figure out a way to get there. It took a lot more thought, and you didn't get there very quickly compared to a stink potter. And you couldn't water ski behind the sailboat. <laughs> That's another thing. I look at that pretty much as um, a real sailor doesn't really lose hope or despair when the weather is contrary because of a deep intention that eventually he's going to get where he wants to go. Because he knows that he can use all of this 
that's going on to his advantage with a little bit of thought, a little bit of forethought, with a little bit of effort. But somebody out there in a powerboat that's run out of gas and the wind comes up and a storm comes up, they're lost. They've just got to heave to and hope that somebody comes and rescues them. Somebody in a sailboat, he'll batten down the hatches, he'll reef the sails, and he'll point the boat in the direction that he wants, wants it to go and that he can work with the wind. And he can work his way out of almost anything. A good sailor can work his way out of almost anything. Now, it's not always possible, but mostly that's how it works. You're in a power boat and you don't have any power. You're dead in the water. You're in a storm in a sailboat. you got a chance. We're like that. Life is a storm. And it is. And you never know when it's going to strike. This may be the calm before the storm. Just like when you were in the grocery store. And there you were with your little objects. And then suddenly an event swept you up and carried you off. Life is like that. Learn how to sail. Learn how to use what happens in life. Learn how to understand that it's not just objects, it's potential events. Learn how to be the sly man, how to be clever, how to be wary, how to use these things, how to be alert. Learn how to be mentally awake. That's what this work teaches. Let the work guide you. Let the work build you up until you find inside of yourself what is really there, real conscience. And then let it guide you. Until then, you've got the work to guide you, and it's a good thing. The problem is shifting the authority from you to it. That takes a little while. For some people, it takes longer. For some people, not so long. Whatever. You've got to start somewhere. I recommend you start. Eventually, you'll get to where you're going.